Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm a cardiologist at the Heart Institute here at the University of Alberta. And I'm going to talk to you about my observations on four different trips that I've made to Nepal to work at a medical school there. And I know this course is about the future of medicine, but going to Nepal is always like a trip back in time. Like it's like going back a hundred years to a very different world. And uh, I'm not sure technological singularity will ever come to, to uh, resource poor countries like Nepal. I'll just tell you some of the problems I witnessed with the technology as it's present now in, um, in Kathmandu. So I'm going to describe the challenges to healthcare in a low income country and uh, the barriers to the use of technology in Nepal. How many of you have been to low income countries? So um, yeah, so four out of six. And I'm sure these problems are found in all of these countries. So Nepal is squeezed between China and India. And it has a great geographic barrier, the Himalayas, along the, the northern border of Nepal. It's really divided into three districts. There's the plains, the Terai which is very similar to northern India. It's quite arid and it's uh, farmland. And then the hill region in the middle is where Kathmandu is. And um, it's hilly. There's been a lot of deforestation, though. And, um, and that's too bad. And then there's the, the Himalayas, which are the highest mountain range in the world. So that's a huge geographic barrier. And people live in villages um, at pretty high elevation. The population is about 29 million people, mainly Hindu, and although it is the birthplace of Buddha. The language is Nepali, although there are many different ethnic languages. And in the universities, or people who go to high school in general will have knowledge of English. And the higher the level of education, the better the knowledge of English, of course. 80% of the population is rural in small villages. So, you know, the population is a little less than than Canada, but the geographic area is much smaller. The literacy rate is much lower in Nepal. Only 60% of people over the age of 15 can read and write versus 99% in Canada. And you can see the disparity between men and women. Many women don't get much of an education, maybe elementary school. Life expectancy at birth has improved over the past 20 years. But it's still like 168 of the 185 or 190 countries of the world. So it's very, very low life expectancy. 65 years for men and 69 years for women. And the infant mortality is high. So out of 1,000 babies born alive, 55 will die before the age of one year. That's very high compared to five in Canada. And there's great geographic disparity in Nepal as well, with healthcare being much worse in the, in the uh, mountains than in the uh, cities. So Nepal is a very beautiful country, and people come from all over the world because of the Himalayas. And there's been a lot of foreign aid from different non-government organizations over the years, but Nepal still remains a very poor country. And the problems are obvious from the time you set foot in the country. So my first trip to Nepal, I went to a conference with this, for the medical school that I'll be talking about. But I also went on a trek close to Everest Base Camp in an adjacent valley called the Hinku Valley. And when you land in Lukla, which is a, a small village, which is kind of the gateway to the, to the Everest, the Kumbu Valley, um, it's a, it's a village that has had quite a lot of funding over the years because of all the mountaineers that have passed through there and more recently tourists. Um, Everest Base Camp is, is a place that many people want to visit. So, you know, the houses are fairly well built. Um, the only access, though, is by plane or you have to walk from Kathmandu. And that's a walk that takes about one to two weeks. The hospital, there's a very nice hospital there, but when I was there, it was barricaded because there was no staff to run the hospital. So a Swiss non-government organization funded this hospital, looked really nice, 
but uh, the gate was padlocked and you could not get in because they didn't have an operating budget to fund it. So, you know, that, that's a problem with technology. You, you build something, you, you can supply technology, but you have to have people who know how to use it and who, who will use it to, um, to its potential. And too often when you walk through institutions in Kathmandu, you see equipment gathering dust, either broken or often it's just broken and there's a part that, that has to come from India or somewhere and it will never come. So trekking through the valleys and passes, you, appreciate, you start to appreciate just how, how, how nature has made it very difficult to survive in this country. Uh, with these high mountains to 8,000 meters um, and the villages are accessible only by trails. So people, people carry everything in these baskets on their backs. So up to 60, 70 kilograms on their backs. On these narrow little trails um, along the side of mountains or over mountain passes. So there is cell phone access pretty much everywhere in Nepal though. So, so cell technology, that's a major uh, successful technological innovation in Nepal and in most other low income countries in the world. Because it doesn't require landlines. It's, uh, it's a very efficient technology. There's a high prevalence of lung disease in Nepal, and that's uh, in part because of very smoky homes. So it gets very cold at night, there's no central heating, people light fires in, in their homes, and then they, um, if there happens to be a chimney, they'll block it off because they want to keep the warm air inside. So they're smoking a lot, they're, they're inhaling a lot of um, macro particles that are like full of carbon and um, toxic to the lungs. So it's kind of like smoking, except they're not actually smoking cigarettes. So just um, a lot of chronic diseases. And every morning when you wake up, you hear people like spitting because they have a lot of bronchial inflammation and then they clear their airways in the mornings and they're just like spitting at about five o'clock. You just hear it <laughs> everywhere. And then lack of sanitation. Uh, once you leave Kathmandu, there's not a lot of toilets, no running water. The outhouses are very decrepit with like rotten boards, um, dirty water, the water's contaminated. So diarrheal diseases are very prevalent just because of poor sanitation. When you come back from a country like Nepal, you are so appreciative of how well, we're able to handle garbage <laughs> and um, how we're able to access clean water and our air is clean. So those are like the basic needs, but healthcare is a huge problem in countries like Nepal because there's, the government sponsors some healthcare for children, but for adults, it's basically whatever you can pay. So if you're not able to afford a pacemaker, you don't get a pacemaker. It's, um, it's whatever you can pay for. So on my first trek, um, we were at a small village, Tagnag, that was very high. And there was a German tourist that was evacuated because he had gastroenteritis and he had medical insurance. So the helicopter, as soon as the weather cleared, I mean, technology is great, but it can't do everything. The helicopter can only land when there isn't dense cloud. So uh, <laughs> technology has a long way to go before it can uh, deal with all the, all the challenges that nature presents to it. So as soon as the weather cleared, the helicopter came in and the trekker was whisked off to Kathmandu. But on that same trip, there was a porter who died from high altitude mountain sickness from pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs because of uh, hypoxemia from the high altitude, so very low oxygen. And he just uh, wanted to be left alone, so his friends left him alone in one of the small huts in the village. And the next morning when they came to find him, he had died. So, uh, you know, his friends weren't aware of the symptoms of, of uh, low oxygen and um, 
and they didn't know to ask for help either from the foreigners who were in the village and some of them had oxygen with them. So very different realities for people who have health care and people who are uneducated and don't have um, ready access to health care. But despite that, I think a lot of people who go to Nepal fall in love with the people there. They're very warm and, uh, and helpful. You know, they always seem to have a smile despite the difficulties that they encounter in their everyday life. So many people come back again and again to do whatever they can to help um, the people of Nepal. So on my subsequent three, three trips, I worked in Kathmandu, which, you know, sounds romantic and all that, but Kathmandu is really a very dirty place. Like, it's in this valley, about the elevation of Calgary, so it's not terribly high. And on most days, you can't see the high peaks of the Himalayas because there's so much smog. The air is very polluted. The water's polluted. It's really crowded. The streets are full of motorcycles and Suzuki cars and and it's very, all very chaotic. So initially, you know, it's quite a shock to be in a place like that. Um, there's garbage everywhere. There's dogs wandering around, especially at night. The dogs start barking. And then there's power outages. So there's rolling blackouts. There's limited power supply, especially during the winter months because the Himalayas are frozen and there's no water, no hydroelectric power have to actually import power from India. That's very expensive. So different neighborhoods will have no power for periods of time, sometimes as long as 16 hours out of 24 during, during the winter months. During the summer, the power is more available because of uh, hydroelectricity. So that's a big challenge because most of our technology requires some sort of power. So I had the opportunity to work at the Patent Academy of Health Sciences, and Dr. Solez has been involved with this medical school since way before. It's, um, well, when it was first in the early stages as it was being planned, and I came the first year that a group of medical students were enrolled in the medical school. So Patton is an ancient city that's right beside Kathmandu. And life in Patton was, um, was very different than here. It was a lot more colorful and a lot more lively. Um, so we lived in this house that you see over on your left side, on the left-hand side. We lived on the bottom floor of this um, home that's owned by an ex-Gurkha soldier. And there was a lovely garden there. And like life was kind of lived on the streets. People would be brushing their teeth on the street and then once in a while there'd be a wedding procession and dancing on the street, so that was lovely. In the morning we'd hear roosters crowing like at around four o'clock in the morning, and our water came from these wells, these wells that people would uh, haul the water up and then place in, in large um, water bottles, and then we'd buy the water bottles from the corner store. And uh, it was really funny, the lady who was selling them to us, she, was, she looked to be like 60 years old, and she asked me if, she wanted, if I wanted her to carry the bottle. Because these people are used to such hard work. They're, um, they, they look old, older than they are, after they reach about the age of 40 years because their life is so physically strenuous. But I was kind of amused that, you know, a 60-year-old woman would uh, think, and she didn't look that strong, would think that she would need to help me carry something. <laughs> Um, so the Patton Hospital is a 450-bed hospital, so it's, it, it's the hospital in the Kathmandu Valley that probably has the best reputation for the care that it gives to the, um, to the to people who live in Kathmandu. There are some private hospitals who deliver very good care to foreigners. It was established in 1953 when there was a cholera epidemic, and you know cholera is still very prevalent in Nepal an infectious disease. It has large obstetrics, pediatrics, and orthopedics departments because those are the common problems that uh, people come to the hospital with. So um, lots of children being born, children have all kinds of infections, and a lot of injuries from falls off uh, scaffolding, motor vehicle accidents, so a lot of trauma. 
Um, the hospital revenue comes mainly from patients and donations. So people pay if they're able to pay, and if not, there are charity cases, and the hospital does receive donations from foreign organizations and, um, and some very large donations from philanthropists in the United States. There's new services, you know, a cardiac ultrasound, an endoscopy, and the intensive care unit has ventilators, and hemodialysis for renal failure is a new, um, is a new technology, but the problem is when the equipment breaks down, there's, there's no replacement. So sometimes things happen, and sometimes they don't. And that's just the way life is there. It's just not, it can't be planned like, um, like we are able to do here. So the first year, like my, my area of um, expertise in, in cardiology is cardiac ultrasound. So the first year that I went there, um, I used this old machine that they had, and I taught one of the internists there to do echocardiography. The image quality wasn't great because the equipment is like 20 years old. But the second year that I went there was even worse because the transducer was broken, so we couldn't even use the machine. So it was just in the corner waiting, and I hear now that they ha there is a transducer on the way to replace the broken one, but this is like four years after it had broken. So uh, when we were there in January, I, I, I brought this very small ultrasound. It's handheld ultrasound, so it's very tiny. Just see it on the, on the lap of the patient there. And then uh, we donate it. This machine is miniaturized. It's $7,000 compared to like 150,000 for the big machines. So it's, it's very useful for screening of valvular disease. And so we left this machine with them in their intensive care unit and, and taught the doctors there how to use it. Now that was the, um, the, the Patton Hospital where I was working. They do have specialized care in Kathmandu at the Shahid Gangalal National Health Center. And they do many operations there every year and it's mainly operations for valve disease or congenital heart disease because those are still the most common heart problems related to infection or malnutrition during pregnancy. So very different from our patient population where we have a lot more coronary artery disease and heart failure. So they do have technology, but you have to be able to pay for it. And in the corner of their ECG lab, they have a small cubicle for penicillin injections to prevent rheumatic fever. And that's very prevalent there still. It's very, very high uh, prevalence. So they do have good technology at the Heart Institute, but you have to be able to, you, you pay directly. For every test that you have, you have to be able to pay. Otherwise, you just don't have the test done. So just to contrast a patient in Nepal versus a patient here um, with all the technology that we bring to the care of these patients, I'm going to present to you two different patients that I, had, I knew well. This Canadian patient I knew really well. He was a 66-year-old man, and he had a lot of chronic disease problems. He was overweight, he had diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, previous smoker. When he was 52 years old, he had a large heart attack, and he had angioplasty of one of the arteries of his heart. And his heart function had decreased by about a third at that time. So a significant scar in the heart. And you know, then over the years, he required another angioplasty, and then he developed heart failure. And just look at all the medications he had to be on. In Nepal, people don't take medications unless they feel sick, and then usually it's an antibiotic that they'll take for a short period of time. There's no kind of preventive care or chronic disease management. Chronic disease management requires a lot of um, medical supervision, a lot of self-monitoring, and taking drugs, a lot of drugs, every day. Um, then he had another high-tech device implanted, a defibrillator and cardiac resynchronization to improve heart function. 
and to give shocks if his heart were to stop. He, and all our technology in medicine carries complications. You know, it has benefit, but there's complications. So he had an infection of his device that had to be removed, another device implanted. And then as the years went by, he developed, he developed worsening heart failure and then kidney failure as well. And um, a lot of rhythm disturbances. So finally, he was being assessed for a heart transplant, but was not a candidate for that because he had very high pressure in the lungs and he also had kidney failure. So then he has a kind of like a mechanical heart implanted, a left ventricular assist device. But by then, you know, he was on, he was dying and he did die a few days after the device was implanted. So this is very costly care that did prolong life to a certain degree, but was associated with a lot of complications and need for ongoing medical supervision and intervention. So high tech, chronic disease management, and very costly. And it's great to say, well, we can afford that in Canada. Well, we really can't as our population ages. And then this Nepali patient that I met, he was 18 years old, so just, just old enough that the government was not going to pay for medical interventions. And he also had heart failure, and he was dying of heart failure. He had a lot of muscle wasting. The reason for his heart failure was severe leakage of his mitral valve because of rheumatic heart disease. And rheumatic heart disease occurs because of recurrent respiratory infections. And then your body mounts an, an, an immune response to that streptococcal bacteria. And some of those antigens are similar to the heart. And so the, basically the, uh, the body mounts um, an inflammatory reaction to the heart valves. So he had severe leakage of his mitral valve. And because of that, his left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart, enlarged and his heart function deteriorated. And his heart was too weak at that point to consider mitral valve replacement. And even if that were an option, he, he and his family couldn't afford it. So he was basically dying at the age of 18 of a disease that we don't see anymore in Canada. And it's not that we have great medical care, which we do, but uh, it wasn't because of that. It's just be because basically we have better homes and uh, people don't all live close together and spread respiratory infections so easily. So it's more related to better living conditions and um, clean air and water. So poverty and uh, big differences in the health care available for poor people. So, the World Health Organization data on Nepal indicates that 50% of deaths are still due to infections, childbirth, and malnutrition. This is similar to all low-income countries with uh, trauma and motor vehicle accidents or other trauma, also very high. There's rampant diarrheal diseases and acute respiratory tract diseases because the air is so polluted, people cough on each other as well all the time. Vector-borne diseases are also common, malaria, leishmaniasis, Japanese encephalitis, dengue fever. TB is endemic, like very, very common. And in addition to these infections that are still very common, now there's a new uh, increase in chronic diseases. And that's really much harder to treat because it requires long-term regular medication. Diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary disease, lung disease, and cancer, renal disease. So those are the medical problems, but really the medical problems are because of the societal problems there. Um, so the major challenges for Nepal are very unstable government and rampant corruption. That's a big issue in all low-income countries, I think. Lack of reliable infrastructure, so the roads are in really poor conditions. Periodically, they're impassable. Electricity is not always available. 
very crowded living conditions, poor sanitation, lack of safe drinking water, so a lot of diarrheal illnesses, poor nutrition, pollution, both from fires in homes, brick factories in the, in the valley, and vehicles that spew diesel fumes in the air. Then there's vulnerability to disasters. Periodically, large earthquakes and landslides occur, and social and health inequity, basically related to the unstable government and the lack of resources in Nepal as well. Like Canada is very fortunate with, um, with the natural resources that we have here. So the medical school that was um, opened up in, pa in Patton att was attempting to address some of the social inequity by trying to improve health care in rural Nepal. I don't know if you can see the sign up at the top, but this, I, I, I took this picture of a sign from, um, from a school in a village in the Kathmandu Valley. Girls' education is the powerful key to ending world poverty. And education is definitely very important. So um, this medical school was basically the dream of Dr. Arjun Karki, a, a respirologist, a pulmonary specialist who came from Nepal and did some of his training in the United States. And his, um, his vision is to improve um, medical care available to people in rural Nepal. Now, Nepal has many medical schools, but the problem is that those are mostly private medical schools, and the students who graduate, they want to um, basically have a better life. So they either work in India or China or come to North America and um, do not work in Nepal. So um, Arjun Karki, basically uh, had a very, he and his friends locally got the support of a large international community of medical educators and, and um, physicians and other leaders to help them open up this uh, new medical school based on, um, based on the principles of medical education as we consider them to be a uh, state of the art. So things like interactive learning, problem-based learning, um, clinical exposure very early on in medical school. So all that was, um, that was the way the school was designed. And this is just a photograph of um, Dr. Karki, who is over here. And um, there's a few Canadians here. This is the Prime Minister of, of Nepal. So the inaugural class at the Patent Academy of Health Sciences was in 2010, and now they're on their fourth batch of students. It's a six-year program and direct entry from medical school, from high school, so these students are quite young. And many of them are on full or partial scholarships with commitments to go back and work in rural Nepal. Now the tuition, half of, the other half of the students are privately funded, a family, and uh, the tuition is expensive, very expensive for a Nepali family. So 50,000 for the six years of medical training. And their resources are much like we would find in kind of a, a junior level high school, like junior high here. So the classrooms are pretty basic and uh, some textbooks. Textbooks are kind of the most important because internet, sometimes there's access, sometimes not. But with, there are small, small rooms for, for problem-based learning and there's a computer lab with enough computers for about half the class. It's about 30 computers. And the students, this is problem-based learning, so you know in small groups, uh, three times a week we would meet and we would discuss a case and uh, develop hypotheses and learning issues to explore pathophysiological mechanisms of these signs and symptoms. So the students are um, certainly very engaged and, um, and uh, like just very polite, wanting to please, great at memorizing, 
But problem-based learning didn't work quite as well here as it does in North America, because in North America, we expect our students to, to use a lot of web-based resources. And here, they had mainly just the textbook to work with. And they would photocopy the whole textbook, of course. So there were definitely some problems in looking things up. We worked with the local faculty just in terms of improving their, their, their knowledge of cardiovascular medicine and uh, brought some textbooks to them. And we did labs, like an, an ECG lab, but you know, equipment would break down, like the, the printer on the ECG, and we would try to fix it. But often there was just a small part that was specific to that equipment and um, couldn't get it. So, so the, we did what we could with the equipment, but it was it wasn't terribly frustrating because that's just the way life is there, but it would be not like, that's just not the type of problem that we would encounter in our healthcare system here. But the students, we had to use very basic methods of, of teaching. And one of the best that we found was learning through the arts. So we had an art contest. And what we found, like, look, this heart is like what Leonardo da Vinci would draw. It was pretty amazing to see how, how beautiful the drawings of the students were and how you can learn anatomy of the heart by just replicating a drawing of the heart or a model of the heart. So that's not really something that we do here <laughs> uh, because we have other resources, either computer-based or actually like dissection of cadavers, which they definitely don't have there. Uh, so, so it was pretty surprising to me to find out how simple, very simple, like a p pencil basically is all you need, how much you could learn with, um, uh, with, with different technology or no technology, because technology was always failing us. <laughs> so the goal of the medical school is to get doctors into rural Nepal, so it was just really, so they did a lot of things, you know, they got kids from rural villages, because they're most likely to return there, gave them scholarships, rotations in rural communities or in the slums of Kathmandu from year one of medical school, giving uh, physicians who are in a rural practice priority for residency positions, and then providing telemedicine support. So remote support for, for um, physicians working in small communities. There's problems with that, internet connectivity, power supply limitations, and uh, limited local expertise. But telemedicine is a big part of delivering healthcare in these remote communities. We use a lot of telemedicine here in Canada as well, but it's, <laughs> it works a lot better. So for example, in, um, in the Edmonton area, that all of, all of Alberta, uh, paramedics, when they assess a patient in their homes with chest pain, they do an electrocardiogram, and that electrocardiogram is transmitted over a cell phone to a cardiologist or an emergency department physician who looks at the electrocardiogram and then tells the paramedics what to do, either to give a clot-busting drug or to transport the patient to, a, to a, a cardiac center or just to any hospital. So we certainly use telehealth to expedite appropriate health care here in Alberta. And there's definitely a huge role for that to play in low-income countries. And this is a system that was developed by, um, in computer science here and by a student who was in this class previously. So it's a portable device unit that works, that can gather physiological parameters of the patient and then transmit it over a satellite phone to a server. And then, you know, people anywhere in the world can look at it and, and give a diagnosis and advice on what to do with the patient. And there's all kinds of sensors or devices that can be attached to this uh, portable diagnostic unit. So you can, you can uh, measure the oxygen in the patient's blood. You can measure their lung volumes. You can measure their blood sugar, their blood pressure, their weight, listen to their hearts, do an ECG, and this is all very automated. You just put one thing on them, and it gathers this data. And then similar to the ultrasound machine that I was using, 
That can be attached to this device as well. So there's a lot of information that can be gathered and then um, transmitted so that advice can be given on the management of the patient. But when I think about technology in uh, a low-income country, I'm just struck by how the technology always seems to, seems to break down or there's lack of power. It just doesn't work so well. So really what seems to work best are curative therapies like antibiotics for an infection. They have to be very affordable, low cost, and easily accessible using, using um, cell phone technology in general. So they have to be low, what I consider low maintenance therapies. Reusing uh, catheters or pacemakers for the heart, using a balloon to dilate a mitral valve, Antibiotics, vaccinations are so important in terms of preventing disease. And it is much easier to deal with infections in low-income countries than with chronic diseases and cancers. And this is the growing uh, epidemic that's coming to low-income countries as their survival improves and they develop degenerative diseases. So cell phones are an amazing technology. Like wherever you go in Nepal, there are cell phones, and they're cheap, really cheap. Um, and this is a, a really good way of communicating with people everywhere, even in remote villages. This is in a monastery in Kathmandu, so, you know, one of the monks is using his cell phone. And uh, Thomas Friedman, a columnist for the New York Times, calls this the uh, rise of the virtual middle class. So these people are still poor. They still don't have toilets and running water and they live in, ho in hovels. But they know what life is like elsewhere. So they, they have middle class expectations. So they want roads, electricity, they want uncorrupted police, good governance. And, you know, technology can certainly improve some aspects of life with use of cell phones, mainly, in these countries, in India. But there are many problems that technology can't by itself solve. And this is, um, this is a little newsletter, Life in Nepal, from about a year ago. And this, these are things that are actually happening in Nepal. You know, politicians offer meat and liquor for votes Lots of illiteracy still, serious hunger problem, open defecation, lawlessness. And that's what's really scary. So hospital workers and doctors are attacked and sometimes killed when a patient dies. Uh, poor infrastructure, and they refer to like roadkill as people who are killed when, um, when they have a motor vehicle accident. Violence, rape laws not enforced. 80 to 90 witches killed annually. So a lot of superstitions and belief systems that are not scientifically based. So a lot of magical beliefs and uh, goat drowning and different things to appease gods. So science and technology are really products of affluent countries. It goes back to the elitism that Dr. Sola is referred to, and I think we've certainly benefited from technology in terms of our quality of life and improved health. And to a certain degree, it has benefited low-income countries as well, because there is some diffusion of this technology, but nowhere near the same extent as what we have here. Low-income countries are, are left far behind because of lack of education and skilled workers to maintain these technologies. And I think overall technology increases the divide between the have and the have-nots. Like our lives are so much easier here because of the technology that we have. And uh, you know, ideally, education is very important in those countries to allow people to develop technology or, or, um, or um, use technology developed elsewhere, but use it specifically for their, for their local needs. So when I think of what's needed in low-income countries, you know, the most important things in terms of health are the environment that you live in. So clean air, sewage management is extremely important, pollution control, improved infrastructure with reliable access to electricity, 
uh, improved health with vaccinations, maternal health, nutrition, and then diagnosis and treatments of communicable and non-communicable diseases. Telemedicine is extremely important in a country that has such great geographic barriers. There's not much research being done in Nepal, but they should start with the database developments. So at least they know what diseases that, you know, what diseases are most prevalent. There are disadvantages to technology as well. Um, because you start to rely on technology, and especially in a country like this, technology routinely fails. And so it's sometimes available and sometimes not. And then, you know, I was really disturbed by all the garbage. You know, they have no way of disposing of garbage. So you have all these wonderful machines, but they're, they were wonderful at one point, but they're outdated, they're not functioning, they're gathering dust, and, and like they have no way of uh, recycling or getting rid of them. It's a big problem. And then loss of simplicity. So I found in Nepal, like people, people in, enjoy what they have and they basically have each other. So enjoyment of simple events such as drinking tea together, that's very important. And sometimes technology leads to um, social isolation that in the long term does not lead to happiness. So just in our own Canadian Medical Association journal last year, problems with technology. Television, computers, and cars, are they making us sick? So the problem with our society is increased obesity and diabetes because of our inactive lifestyle and very um, rich and salty foods. And then, you know, we, we live with a lot of technology and there's definite disadvantages to that as well. When, you know, whenever you go walking around, just look at all the people who are on cell phones. So they're distracted, they're not noticing what's around them at that time. And many studies have shown that multitasking is really not an effective way of dealing with different tasks at the same time. You're not, you're not dealing with them as well. So if they're important, you're best to do one thing at a time. So people are increasingly distracted, inattentive to the present, takes them longer to react when they actually see something in their environment. And then with heart disease, we deal a lot with heart failure and, and death. And what I've come to um, experience many times is how people have this belief that somehow technology is gonna allow them to live forever. So it's like a death denial that's in our culture now. So um, it really, it's like people have put their lives on hold and when they're really sick and they're dying, now they expect that somehow technology is gonna keep them alive much longer. And that's not the reality. So, um, and the same thing with natural disasters. Like it's like, oh my gosh, this shouldn't happen. Floods and earthquakes and, and uh, hurricanes. We should be able to predict this and you know, prevent it somehow. And that's not really the way things work. I mean, there's a, a risk in, with natural disasters. That's just part of, part of life. And uh, the only way to deal with it is to be vigilant and to, to help each other out when something like that happens. And more and more, you know, people want everything done when they're dying. But really, that's a little too late. And all this technology at end of life is extremely expensive for our society and it results in significant, in people who survive long ICU stays, it results in brain damage. And uh, it certainly prolongs the time that you are, you are uh, unresponsive and basically dying. So technology, the way it is right now, can keep you alive maybe a little bit longer, but it's not often in a very good, in a very good state. So it's kind of an in between, what I think of as an in-between zone. You're not fully alive, but you're not fully dead with more and more assist devices. So not so great. Some good things from technology, but some not so good things. So when I think, you know, from my experiences in Nepal and the practice of medicine here for so many years, I think we're very fortunate that technology enhances our lives here. 
and especially it just it just makes our lives so much easier. It gives us access to um, food in abundance, well-designed homes, electricity, communication improves our health. But at the same time, low-income countries also have something that we can lack in our society. So the importance of a simple life, community, physical togetherness, not on cell phones, but actually with each other, mindfulness, in touch with nature. I noticed Mountain Equipment Co-op is putting together a really big initiative to try to get young people outside again. And nature is extremely important, I think, to, uh, to allow us to see the cycle of life. And um, yeah, our, or, you know, we're part of nature. And technology can be very distancing, helping others, so, um, so I think it's important to, to maintain some of these things that are found in abundance in low-income countries because that's really all they have. And use technology wisely, but not expect everything from, from technology. So um, yeah, thanks for your attention. And uh, those are my experiences and observations in Nepal, and uh, it's certainly made me aware of how extremely fortunate we are here, but also how much we have to learn from people in those countries as well. So any questions? Um, hi, I'm just wondering in terms of the most effective way to help improve conditions in places like Nepal, do you think it's more effective for foreign and uh, non-profits to go in and help or to empower the central government to take a more proactive role? It's very hard to empower the government. I think that has to come from the people themselves. So I think everything has to come from the local people. So um, we respond to their requests for assistance. So we got involved with this medical school because of Dr. Arjun Karki, who sought out uh, North Americans and Europeans and Australians to help with the medical school. So I, I, I think it's definitely problematic for us to come in and try to, to emulate what we have here because it's a totally different culture. So I think it has to come from them and I think, um, I think they, they, they are the ones that have to ensure that they have a government that's representative and, and honest. Yeah, we, just because I think nonprofits can make a lot of difference in the short term, but if yeah. you're talking about long term in the next, say, 50 years, then you need the people there to, you know, or the yes. government there to help their own people. Absolutely. Like, ne Nepal is full of things that well-intentioned non-government organizations have tried to do, but it never works in the long term. Like, for example, uh, one organization wanted to have more outhouses. You know, that's a great idea. But uh, people just didn't understand that. And so the outhouses were basically used to store grain. Yeah, it has to, it has to come from the people. But I think now, with the internet, people are much more aware of what, how much better life could be, and that's important. Um, when you were in Nepal, did you see any use of like renewable technologies like solar, wind power? I'd imagine they'd be, if they are there, brought in by NGOs, but are they being used if they are there? Yeah, yeah, we saw like a solar dish being used for cooking um, in a small village. And they do use solar power uh, for, for some, to power up some, some generators. But there's a lot of cloud cover so I, I don't think the solar power is real. I mean, solar power is a great idea, um, but I didn't see a lot of it being used. Um, I was just wondering how effective the techniques that the Bataan Medical School is using to recruit um, the rural students are and just encouraging them to stay and practice in rural communities because I'd imagine that uh, once they're educated and they know that they can 
um, pursue a better life in another country, I think the pull uh, might be pretty strong. So how effective uh, is it to uh, just encourage the students to stay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do they encourage students to stay in Nepal? So many of them are on scholarships, so they have to, they have to work for three years in a rural community when they graduate. But then after that, the only thing you can do is you can make it attractive, I guess, for them to stay by, um, by giving them the support they need with, with uh, telehealth. I mean, that's basically, uh, that's basically what the medical school offers physicians in rural areas. Um, it, they don't have much of a postgraduate program, like for specialization. So their graduates will usually go to China or India to uh, pursue postgraduate training. And I think, you know, what draws them back to Nepal are basically their families and their culture, like that still remains really strong. So um, what I noticed is that some, some well-educated Nepalis would, would live in Australia, but if their parents got sick or, you know, at least once a year, they would come back to Kathmandu to spend time with the family. Like the family is extremely important. But in terms of working in Nepal, it's, it's very difficult to prevent out-migration unless you build a better society. Yeah, so I don't think, you know, they won't ever be successful with all their graduates, but if they're successful with 50%, that's still better than the current lack of physicians in uh, rural Nepal. Um, going back to the outhouses point, I work, volunteered in Ecuador for a month and our point, we built houses for them and our point was if we build these houses, you have to respect them and we'll teach you like new ways of doing things that like will sustain the houses. I was wondering how much like education goes into like people there being like, like this is why you want to use the outhouses as like outhouses and not something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't really involved in those projects in, in rural Nepal, so I, I can't really speak to that. But I have a feeling that there was probably education that took place and they were probably being used while the uh, foreigners were there. But then probably shortly after they left, unless the behavior is reinforced and there's some sort of tangible benefit, it's, it's just hard to imagine that they would continue it long term. They just feel it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of beliefs and they feel that it's basically healthier to defecate out in the field. It takes a long time to, to get rid of that kind of thinking. While you were there, did you notice like a lot of homeopathic, homeopathic medical practices? Because you says they believe in like witches or like goat drowning by any mm -hmm. chance? Yeah, um, that's more in the rural, in the villages, as opposed to Kathmandu. But um, the, what I did notice is that the pharmacies in, in, the, in the city, you can just buy antibiotics over the counter. And that's, that's really bad because that builds up resistant organisms that are, that are much harder to treat than when people have serious infections. So what I noticed in, when, on, on my trek when we were in these small villages is that there were, um, there were lamas, like priests, um, that people would consult. And then they would, also, they would also ask for Western medicine as well. So they, they, would, they would go for both of them. Or maybe the ones that got better didn't come for Western medicine consultation. It's very different, like they, they just seek assistance when they're acutely ill. And that's a problem for chronic disease management because you, know, you don't really have any symptoms until you have a stroke from high blood pressure. So just in further answer to your uh, question about how to keep people there as opposed to having them go, go to some other country, they often start like with a medical student who's been a paramedic for a while or a nurse and has, you know, extensive 
family in the region. And the uh, interviews in, include questions about, you know, motivation. It, that, that's just as important as proving that you're smart and, you know, innovate <laughs> is, is, is proven that you're motivated to really help the people in the country. And I think it, it, it works moderately well. Um, I think both uh, Bibiana and I have, have, have learned a lot from, from this you know, exposure. It's, it's not just a top-down thing that we go there and you know, um, give the locals our extensive wisdom. They, they also have a lot of wisdom to pass on to us. And, and, and like part of it is the problem-based learning that we do here um, the, the character of the students is a bit different. They're, they're more inclined, I think, to you know, memorize and kind of recite things, whereas here there's a strong influence, a strong um, incentive to, to just sort of think things through and not, not you know, in, in your uh, small group sessions to be repeating things that you've memorized necessarily. Um, so, the, and I think, more of the world is like uh, Nepal than is like Edmonton. So, so I mean, it's important for, for us to realize. And this idea on, on one of uh, Dr. Kujek's slides of, the, of, of, of living well, you know, they're, they're, if you just think of that phrase, what does it mean to you, you know? You can live well and be poor. You can live well and be, you know, hungry sometimes. It's, it's a whole different category of, of, of thing. And what's striking, I think, to everybody who goes there, there's a website probably many of you know, uh, transparency.org, and it tells you how corrupt various countries are, and there are statistics about it. And, you know, Nepal is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. But um, we don't really feel that so, so much when we're there. You know, we're, 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 we're dealing with, with people who are just as valuable to make friends with uh, as the people here. You know, the human interaction seems to have at least as much, if not more, warmth there than it does here. So it, it just shows you that when you look at the countries on you know, transparency.org that score very low, it doesn't mean that you can write those people off and you know, not try to help them. It is true, though, that it's a huge challenge because, as you say, the government, in, in theory, should, should be providing the basics. And you know, the NGOs should, should just sort of be adding things on, on the top of that. And if you need bribes paid and you know all, all sorts of, of, of things like that in order to get things done through the government. And the other thing is it's a lot of political turmoil there. So um, you know the people in charge change, the rules for things change. But I can tell you some, something happened to me here that was very, very instructive. I, I spent a week, weekend with a bunch of other medical leaders here uh, talking about medical professionalism. And uh, I, I was talking about some of the problems we don't have here. Like we, we don't have, as Dr. Kujek said, uh, patients' families threatening to kill us or actually trying to do that when there's an you know, unfavorable outcome. When somebody in the family dies, the family turns on you, and you know, and you 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 don't have people paying huge bribes to to get things done. But um, I was amazed. <laughs> Very well respected surgeon got up and said, "That's true. We don't have, but the problems we do have." are just as severe as the problems there. And, and you know, he went, went on to list the problems we have here. So in his mind, and I think in the mind of 
many of the others who were with me that weekend, we have an equal number of problems. They aren't the same, but <laughs> I mean, it isn't that, that you would say, well, I, I'm not really going to go there because it's just, you know, a, it, 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 there's so many problems you, you could never solve anything meaningful. And I think one of the, the, the enjoyable things about a medical career is you can take the most corrupt, war-torn country in the world and you can still do something good. You can, you know, benefit the people. It, it's, it's not that it's such a mess that you leave without any feeling of, of having, you know, helped at all. That doesn't seem to happen. So the, the value to me of a lecture like this is, is to give you an idea of what the reality is, what it's really like. <laughs> because I think you, 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 you can get, if, if you just look on various tables of where the country sits in terms of, uh, you know, per capita income uh, and, and things like that, and then spending time there and getting to know the people, it's, it's, it's entirely different. And then when, when, when you consider the fact that you're in this course about, you know, technology and the future of medicine, it would not be a valid course at all if we just consider developed countries and rich countries. I think that, that's a completely artificial view of the world. So we need to consider technology on, on the one hand. But then also, you know, what, 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 what does it really mean? You know, like... Um, can, can you imagine, for instance, take something that we talk about periodically here, that is wireless power, that power for your you know, devices and, and so on. It, it's really the most primitive technology. It hasn't moved very far. You still need to plug things into the wall. You know, the, the, the whole deal about powering devices is pretty primitive. But you can imagine that wireless power, the idea of power just being in the air, so you never have to plug something in, will, will come. We're, we're close to that now, and then poor countries will also have that. And just like the cell phone has made a much greater difference, really, in the lives of people in Central Africa, you know, in Nepal, than it has here, similarly, wireless power is going to be amazing. I mean, suddenly, there are all sorts of things that they'll be able to do uh, throughout the day that, that right now they, they can only do for a portion of the day. So there, there, there's a great deal to look forward to, things that the global advance of you know, technology will, will bring to poor countries that will help them, you know, a great deal. So, so it's not like what we're talking about in this course is not relevant to them. But we just have to you know, conceptualize how is it relevant? Where, where does it fit in? You got four minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that there has been like an increase in chronic conditions in Nepal as well, so like cancer, diabetes, and all those. Why do you think is that? Because don't, they don't have like a rich, fatty diet like we do, right? No, so why is there an, an increase in chronic diseases in low-income countries? Well, in part it's because people are living longer as infections um, are treated better, and, uh, and uh, fewer children die in their first year of life, so more, more people are living to an older age. And then there's just a global movement from rural to urban environments. And in the cities, well, that's where you have um, pollution and more sedentary lifestyles, so much less physical activity. So, you know, in Nepal you have out in, out in the rural communities, you have infections and childbirth that kills people off. And then in the cities, you have um, the chronic diseases. So 
It's, it's not so much diet, probably, in, in Nepal. I mean, Indian, India does have a very rich fatty diet, but, uh, but I think it's more just the, the pollution and the more sedentary lifestyles in cities. Um, but overall, of course, it's still an improvement as people move to cities because they do have better access to, to some health care. Um, so people are living a little bit longer, but it's nowhere near what they're living to in, um, in North America or Europe. I think one other factor is probably globalization of, you know, diet. They see ads for, for things, you know, junk food and so on. And now in many of these poor countries, you, you can get the same things to eat that, that, that we have in, in Western countries, pro probably some of which are more... Uh, uh, related to, to, you know, development of chronic disease. Um, but, um, no, I think the same thing's happening worldwide. I mean, there, there is a gradual shift in the predominant disease burden of, of the world. It used to be, you know, acute illness and uh, infectious disease, and, and, and it's becoming chronic uh, more and more just about everywhere. Um, so uh, Nepal certainly isn't unique in that way. Okay, I just wanted to, to explain once more what's happening in terms of the next five lectures, just so you all know what's, what's coming. So there are four lectures on artificial intelligence, the first three by Osmer Zayan, and uh, so the, the first one will be on Tuesday the 23rd and then Thursday the 25th and Tuesday the 30th. And then Patrick Polarski will speak on October 2nd. Then on October 7th, Ross Lockwood is going to talk about there's still plenty of room at the bottom. It's a talk about nanotechnology. And then there'll be, you know, the, the, the great silence. You'll, you'll get a week of an, and a half where you're on your own to go back to the previous uh, videos from the course and to listen to those in subjects of particular interest to you. And then you, you come back for the next lecture on the 21st. Uh, of, of October and your paper on, it, it's a short pa paper, not terribly onerous, but your critique of one of the previous lectures is due on, on October 23rd. Uh, now, I, I'm going to stop at that point because there's still a bit of flux in, in, in terms of exactly what, what we're going to do from that point onward. Um, but I, I have a feeling, and am I right about this, that unlike previous classes who have loved doing things in the evening, a lot of you have uh, obligations in the evening. So the, the appeal of, of like doing the student uh, presentations in the evening for you guys is actually limited. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it would probably make sense for us to use the last three uh, class periods, which I think is November 25th, 27th, and uh, December the 2nd, for your presentations d during regular class time. And, and um, you can always watch the performance uh, of me and other people during the parties that we've had. It's on video. You can look at uh, Nikolai Smith, the clown, and his bullwhip and all that stuff. And it's just not something that you'll get to personally experience this year. So am I uh, right about that, that, that probably you, you would 
mostly prefer to have your your uh, presentations during regular class time? Yeah. Yeah. But I think the rest of you, it it it, it just seems like. We, we might as well try it. That way, that's sort of the traditional way to run a course is to run the course during the regular scheduled time. So I, I think would be my plan to sort of do that this year um, because of, of uh, the generalized, not for every single one of you, but, it, but in general, I just don't sense a lot of, lot of enthusiasm for doing things in the evening. Um, so that that being said, I'm I'm still not sure exactly um, who's presenting then later in October and in early November. We still have some you know decisions to make about uh, faculty presentations. I I told you about how exciting it was for you to be uh, taught by young people more or less your own age. But when we do that, we're, we're, we're having you taught by people who are in training, usually in surgery training programs, which are extremely onerous and have tough rules for call and stuff. So we can't plan their presentations a long time ahead. I mean, it would be nice if we could, but so Shauna, Shauna Panja, I'm, I'm thinking that she will give her lectures in early uh, November, but I'm really not sure. It depends upon the neurosurgery, on-call schedule, and a bunch of other things. Um, so anyway, I've, I've told you what we're doing up until about October 23rd. So any, any questions about any of that? No? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, and and if any of you, I mean, you don't always. <laughs> this is not your only opportunity. If you want to send me email privately saying I really want the bullwhip, Kim, bring back the bullwhip. Um, even though I, I think I said on that occasion, <laughs> this is a little bit more primitive, you know, entertainment than I ever want in this course again, um, or. It, if there's anything else that, that you would like uh, fine-tuned, as, as we've said from, from the beginning, this is sort of your course. There's no other course like it, so you're, you're helping to kind of fine-tune fine exactly how it goes. The little talk that I gave at the beginning here, um, it's quite important to me, if, if some of you feel that I'm on the w wrong W wavelength there that, you know, men should be in charge of all major decisions in the world for the rest of the time or so something, let me know because, uh, you know, I, 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 I often give people the impression that these ideas came from the interaction that I had in this course. So if you really feel that I'm completely out to lunch with this idea about, you know, the great filter, please let me know. Okay, thank you, Bibiana, very much.